One of the wonderful features of the periodic table is that it has an awful lot of trends built into it. And these trends are really useful because just by looking at the periodic table and seeing an element is here, an element is there, you can make all sorts of qualitative inferences about their relative properties. The reason these trends exist is because the structure of the periodic table, we've structured it so that the outer electrons from the s orbitals and the p orbitals and the d orbitals and the f orbitals are all grouped together and they're also grouped by increasing energy level. So the, the filling of the electrons and the shape of their orbitals and the size of their orbitals all influence these different trends in the periodic table. Now the valence electrons, that's the name that we give to these outermost electrons, which really count. They're the ones that can participate in chemical bonding. Uh, so they're gonna be the ones in whatever our, our last energy shell is that we've added. And each of these energy shells, we're gonna draw these the Bohr way for simplicity. But remember, each shell actually contains all of these orbitals for that energy level. So they're not all spherical like Bohr would have thought, but you know the, the p orbitals and the d orbitals, etc., will, will all fit in a re same relative area. Now for the main group elements, these valence electrons are just going to be equal to the s electrons and the p electrons. So that's going to be whatever has the largest n value because that's gonna be the highest energy level. And a shortcut for that for the main group is you can just look up the group number. And I mean the group number by the classic notation where you have like 1a, 2a, and then you skip down to the b's, but then back up to the 3a, 4a for the main group elements. For the transition elements, the number of valence electrons is gonna be equal to the outer s electrons and the outer d electrons. And the d electrons are going to be uh, one energy level less than the s electrons, but they're going to be very close in energy. So it turns out that they are also accessible performing chemical bonds. And then the core electrons will be all the other electrons, which are in the interior. So for example, this picture, we have filled up the 1s shell and so we have two electrons serving as core electrons. Now here we have the n equals two shell where we have two electrons in the 2s and two electrons in the 2p, which I have just drawn all together here in, in this pseudo Bohr picture. And so there are four valence electrons then for this n equals two energy level. And the, the core electrons can be found if you know the valence electrons and the total electrons is the difference between them. Let's say that we want to figure out how many valence electrons exist for titanium and oxygen as elements. Well, for titanium, it's in the transition group. So since it's in the transition group, then we count both the uh, largest n value, which is four, so everything that has a four in front of it, and we also count n minus one for the d orbitals, which is going to be three. So there are two electrons in the 4s, and there are also two electrons in the 3d for titanium, and so that makes a total of four valence electrons for titanium. And then all the other electrons are in the inner core and they're not accessible for bonding. If we add those all up, then we have a total of 18 core electrons. Now if we consider oxygen, oxygen's a main group element. And so for oxygen, we filled up the 1s with two electrons and then we've started on n equals two and since two is the largest number here. We add up everything for the S's that have two in front of it and all the P's that have a two in front. And that's two plus four is six 
valence electrons for oxygen. Now for the main group, there's also a shortcut. We actually just have to look up the group number, and that will tell us how many valence electrons there are. And this is one of those handy patterns that arises in the periodic table because of the way that we've structured it. So if we look over here, oxygen is in group 6A, and so it automatically has six electrons. And the reason for that is because the, this first and second electron, we've stuck in the 1S, now we started on the energy level where n equals 2, and we put 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So that's going to be true for all of the main group elements in the S block and the P block. We're going to introduce a new idea now, which is effective nuclear charge. What effective nuclear charge is, it's the charge that's actually experienced by the electrons on the outside of an atom. This is different from the nuclear charge because the inner electrons have an effect. They cancel out some of that interior nuclear charge. So for the outer electrons, the amount of attraction they feel towards the interior of the atom is going to be equal to the total charge in the nucleus, total number of protons, minus whatever the amount of screening is from the interior electrons. So that essentially it comes out to the average number of electrons um, between our outer electron and the nucleus. And it's an average because our electrons have different shaped orbitals and there's some overlap and so they're, they're not strictly built up in layers on top of each other. And so they're not entirely either below or above whatever the electron is that we're considering. Now we can either look up that value or we can calculate it using, for example, what's called Slater's rules. And that's not something I'm gonna cover right now though. So for, for now you can just assume that if you use this formula, S is gonna be something that you look up. Now this is approximately equal to the nuclear charge minus the number of core electrons. And this is assuming essentially that we have the Bohr model where the electrons in each energy level are in these nice spherical orbitals. And so, for example, here we have our, our 1s electrons are all completely beneath these 2s and 2p electrons. And so they cancel out two charges of this total six positive charge in the nucleus. So these outer electrons would experience plus four charge. Now, of course, we know the, the Bohr model is not the truly accurate picture of the atom. It's just a useful approximation. And to get a better answer, we need to take into account the properties of the wave functions, which describe these individual orbitals. And there's a shortcut here. And the shortcut's the same as our shortcut for figuring out the number of valence electrons. The effective nuclear charge is approximately equal to the, the group number, as long as we're talking about a main group element. And that makes sense because valence electrons are the outer electrons that we have stacked on. And here we're essentially saying the charge minus the inner electrons, what's left over is the outer electrons. Now if we do this for aluminum, let's go ahead and find the approximate value for the effective nuclear charge and compare it to the true value. So our approximate value is going to be equal to the nuclear charge minus the number of core electrons. Aluminum is over here, it's element 13, so it has 13 protons, each with plus one charge, so our charge in our nucleus. And we have 10 core electrons. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 from filling up the 1s and the 2s and the 2p. So that's neon right here. So that counts for our 10 core electrons. And then we have 1, 2, 3 left over. Remember our shortcut for main group elements, we can just look at the, the group number as long as we're using this older notation. And so because aluminum is in group 3a, that means it has 
plus three charge for its effective nuclear charge. Now if we want the precise value, we can use this formula. And I'm just going to look up the value for S here. Just remember, you can also calculate using something like Slater's rules. And we get a value of 10.424. It's a little bit more than an approximate value of 10 that we used in the previous calculation. And so this gives us a total effective nuclear charge of 2.576. It's not way off from our previous number. If we rounded this up, we would we'd get plus three as before, but still you know, about 20% different. Now as we go across the periodic table, the effective nuclear charge increases. Because as we're going across, we're adding more protons and more electrons. But our electrons, as we're going across, we're adding valence electrons. So, for example, here, start off with the third element, and then the fourth element, and the fifth element. So the third element has three electrons, and two of those are in the 1s, and so we have one valence electrons. And then we have the fourth element, so it has four electrons, but still only has two core electrons. And same thing for the fifth element, it only has two core electrons. So that only going to cancel out two of the protons in each case, and we have an increasing effective nuclear charge then. This electron experiences a plus one charge, this experiences a plus two charge, and this experiences a plus three charge. One of the consequences of that is that these outer electrons here are being more tightly bound to the nucleus. And so they will tend to contract in towards the nucleus, and the atom gets smaller. So as we go across the periodic table, atoms get smaller. Now once we reach our noble gas, we've filled up all the possible values for that n, then we move on to the next n. So the next n, we start a new shell of electrons. And this shell of electrons is going to involve orbitals which are further out from the nucleus. So now our atom is larger. So atom size is going to increase as we go down the periodic table and decrease as we go across the periodic table. And the total consequence of that is that the largest elements are going to be in the bottom left corner and the smallest elements are going to be in the upper right of the periodic table. And here's a chart that gives you an idea of the actual relative sizes of these elements. And these numbers here give the size in picometers. And so you can see cesium is much larger than fluorine. But actually, most of these atoms, they're, they're fairly similar in size because we, we decrease in size and we go up in size and we decrease and we go up. And so there's a compensating effect. And then the result is that, in general, atoms are, are roughly all the same order of magnitude in size. It would be a much different universe if cesium atoms were 10,000 times the size of fluorine atoms, for example. But in general, all atoms are about the size of an angstrom or so. Another important quality of atoms, which can be roughly predicted from the periodic table, is electronegativity. And this is the tendency of atoms to attract electrons towards themselves. And we especially are interested when they form chemical bonds, which atom is going to have a, a dominant control of those electrons, which is going to shift it more towards itself and away from the other atom. So this is going to increase with our effective nuclear charge. More nuclear charge means that there's more residual charge to pull on those electrons. And if we add new electron shells, then the electrons are now all further from the nucleus. So that means that we are going to have lower electronegativity, less ability of the, the nucleus to attract those electrons. And last consideration is that if we have a noble gas, then even though 
that has a, a very large effective nuclear charge, it doesn't want any more electrons. If we stick on another electron, it's going to have to go into the next energy shell, which is where we see a decrease. So noble gases effectively just don't have any electronegativity. So this is the, the trend for our electronegativity. It increases until we get up to the fluorine in the upper right of the periodic table. Fluorine is the most electronegative of all the elements, and the noble gases don't want any electrons, so they're kind of an exception here. Here's a chart giving the actual electronegativities for many elements. It's color-coded, so darker hue of purple means you have more electronegative elements. And visually, you can see that it's very dark over here in the upper right of the periodic table. And you can also see it's not a clear trend. There's some variation, especially over here in the transition metals. But in, in general, it's true that it's not very electronegative in the bottom left corner. It is very electronegative in the upper right corner. And the noble gases, they don't have any electronegativity. Now this scale was developed by Linus Pauling, and it's an arbitrary scale, so it doesn't have any units associated with it. It's essentially just a ranking from zero to four based on what Linus Pauling experienced in the laboratory, looking at a bunch of different compounds over which elements would tend to gain electrons and which elements would tend to lose electrons when they form the compounds. But it's, it's a very useful scale for making predictions about how those electrons are going to move when we form compounds. A not altogether dissimilar idea is that of ionization energy. And this is the amount of energy needed to remove the outermost electron. So electronegativity asks how much an atom wants an electron when it's forming bonds. Ionization energy asks how much an atom wants an electron that it already has. And in this case, it's not an arbitrary scale. We can actually measure how much energy it takes to remove this electron. So our reasoning is essentially the same as it is for electronegativity. So we go across the periodic table, our effective nuclear charge will increase. And so we will more tightly bind that outermost electron, take more energy to remove it. And if we go down the periodic table, we add more electron shells. So now that outermost electron is further away from the nucleus, it's going to be easier to remove it, require less energy. And the overall result is that our ionization energy increases as we move up towards fluorine and it will be very small for things like cesium. So here are the actual values for the amount of energy needed to remove an electron from these atoms in their gaseous state. These are positive values because this is an endothermic reaction. It's gonna cost us energy to do this. And you can see that this replicates our trend. We start off with very small energies, for example, 380 joules per mole for cesium, and then we wind up with very large energies, more than 2,000 joules per mole to take an electron away from helium. The metallic character is a trend that we've actually used before, but now we can sort of see more why it exists the way that it does. Metallic character is essentially the ability of an element to give away its electrons. Now, as our effective nuclear charge increases, then we are going to have less ability to give away those outer electrons. But as we add on additional electron shells, it's gonna be easier to give away those outer electrons. And so our metallic character will increase as we go down the periodic table. And the total result is that as we go down and left, we have more metal-like substances. And as we go to the upper right, then we have less metal-like substances. And that's where we have our, our non-metals on the periodic table.